Welcome to our online service today. It's great to be welcoming you from our lounge to your lounge. We're going to just tell you a couple of it's our favourite things. A couple of our favourite things about online church. Daniel, go for it. Um, I I really like um, Young at Heart. I I really like the Zoom call afterwards. I really like dancing. Dancing, yeah. So I hope you're really enjoying uh, this way of meeting together. Uh, it's difficult, I know, but let's try and make the most of it. And it's good to be family together. Rachel is going to lead us into worship uh, right away. And then John's going to be preaching to us later on. We've got a young at heart, which is uh, going to be uh, a little bit different this time, but we hope you enjoy it. And so let's have a great service together, Grace Church. And uh, we're with you all the way. Cheers. Hello, Grace Church. I hope you've made it through another difficult week okay. It's great that you're here. I heard a quote the other day that may help us as we come to worship. Now, when the world grows darker, and it certainly feels very dark right now, doesn't it? When the world grows darker, the light of Jesus shines brighter. So let's step into his light now and know Jesus, the light of the world, surrounds us as we lift our voices in praise. And let's let go of anything that we may have been holding on to. Fear, anxiety, disappointment, until we're only holding on to Jesus. The words of Psalm 93 will help us, remind us that Jesus is King. Our Lord, you are King. Majesty and power are your royal robes. You put the world in place and it will never be moved. You have always ruled, you are eternal. The ocean is roaring, Lord. The sea is pounding hard. The mighty waves are majestic, but you are even more majestic and you rule over all. Your decisions are firm and your temple will always be beautiful and holy. What amazing truths for us to step into. Why don't you stand if you're able and let's worship together.
king over everything and we thank you that you reign over all and we say please come and reign in us again and we thank you that we can come into that place of friendship with you not because of who we are or what we've done but because of who you are and what you have done father we just thank you that you've made it possible for us to step out of the darkness and into your light because of your great kindness, your love for us, because you gave your life for us. You broke the power of sin and darkness and everything that holds us. So Father, we step into your love, we step into your light, we hold on to you and we say, please reign in our hearts. Thank you, Jesus, that you are King. We love you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Please accept our praise as we come together this morning. Bless you, Lord. Amen.
me rolling. They hating, patrolling, and trying to catch me riding dirty. Another big welcome to you, Grace Church, if you've um, joined us part way through. Hope you've enjoyed it so far. Um, we're just going to share a few notices with you now. It's not um, too late to join our midweek events, Alpha or Life groups. Yeah, join in with those. We wanted to take a few seconds just to report back on our Christmas offering. Um, Caleb's got the total for us on his bit of paper that he's coloured in. So go for it, Caleb. What do you want to say to everyone at Grace Church? Thank you, Grace Church. Thank you, Grace Church. Look at that total, £4,752 that's been raised to some amazing projects. A couple of things here in Milton Keynes, the Winter Night Shelter and MK Money Lifeline. And then money towards a water project in Liberia. We feel like we've nearly raised the total that's needed. We're still looking into the finer details behind that. But what an amazing thing that loads of money from that is going to go towards helping children and a whole community have safe water to drink. So praise God. Thank you so much, Grace Church, for giving so faithfully into that. And on the topic of giving, there should be a button. Let's all point that way, kids. should be a button around there somewhere that says give. And that's just to help you find out about giving uh, into our church funds. Anna's just going to pray for all the money that's given that God will help us use it as best as possible. Dear God, please may all the money get get given to good uses and not just wasted. Amen. 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 Brilliant. Well, honour of our service and it's a great honour and privilege to hand over to one of the elders of Grace Church, John Kempster, who's going to be continuing our First Things First series. So what do we want to say to John? Should we say, go for it, John? Go for it, John! Good morning, Grace Church. It's great to be uh, with you this morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name's John. I'm part of the uh, eldership team here at Grace Church. We've uh, been having a series on First Things First, and we've had some great teaching from both Tim and James on rest and holding on and on um, who, how do you think. So I would encourage you uh, to, to, to download those and have a listen to them if, if you haven't. There's some great teaching. And I'm uh, bringing you uh, my thoughts on first things first. Now, <clears throat> when I was thinking about this, I've been drawn uh, to prayer. I know this is something that I preached uh, on back in May, but I believe prayer is so important to us as Christians. I actually, you know, I don't make an apology for preaching uh, or returning 
uh, to this subject. Now, I heard a story the other day about a man who uh, encouraged, who encountered, sorry, uh, a bit of trouble. He was flying his small aeroplane uh, and he called the control tower and he said, pilot to tower, I'm 300 miles from the airport, 600 feet above uh, the ground and I'm out of fuel. I'm descending really rapidly. Please advise, over. Tower to pilot, the dispatcher began. Repeat after me, our Father who art in heaven. Prayer is, for the most part, an untapped resource. An unexplored continent where uh, untold treasure remains to be unearthed. It is talked about more than anything else and practical and practiced even less than anything else. And yet, for the believer, it remains one of the greatest gifts our Lord has given us outside of salvation. In 1952, Albert Einstein was delivering a lecture on the campus of Princeton University. A student asked this famous scientist, what is there left in the world for original dissertation? What research can I do? With considerable thought and wisdom, Einstein replied, find out about prayer. Somebody must find out about prayer. Instead of it being something that we do every day, like breathing, eating and walking and talking, it seems to have become like that little glass covered box on the wall that says break in case of emergency. It is true that so very often we associate prayer with crises in our life. Tim Keller, in his uh, book on prayer, says prayer is awe intimacy and struggle, yet the way to reality. There is nothing more important or harder or richer or more life altering. There is absolutely nothing so great as prayer. And F.B. Mayer, the author of a great little book called The Secret, Gu the Secret of Guidance said, the great tragedy of life is not unanswered prayer, but an unoffered prayer. Now, the Apostle Paul was somebody who understood prayer and its power. Prayer was a main part of Paul's life and he took it for granted that it would be part of the life of every Christian. I'm going to take my reading today from Colossians uh, chapter 1, verse 9 to 14. And so it says, And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with the power according to his glorious might for all, enduring, for all endurance and patience with joy. Giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. You know, I don't think you can be a Christian and not pray. Like you cannot have a good marriage if you don't talk to your wife. You can be a Christian and not pray, just like you can be married and not talk to your wife. But in both circumstances, you're going to be miserable. Prayer is the pipeline, the conduit of communication between God and his people, between God and those who love him. And there are several, several even, good reasons uh, to pray. One, it's a great privilege. Can you think of any greater honour than to have an audience with the one who rules over all creation, 
we have been invited to talk with the one who put the stars into place. We are invited to seek counsel from the one who is truth and wisdom. We are invited to sit down with the one who knows all things. The Puritan, John Preston, lays it out very plainly. He says, prayer is a privilege purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. Christ died for this end. It cost him the shedding of his blood so that we, through him, might have entrance to the throne of grace. You know, conversation is part of any vital growing relationship. We sometimes measure the quality of a marriage relationship by how well by how well the couples communicate. Or to state it in another way, uh, one of the first things people point as evidence that a marriage is in trouble is the lack of communication. The same is true of our relationship with the Father. True, honest, heartfelt conversation is a sign of a healthy relationship. A lack of conversation, or conversation only in public, is a sign of a relationship that's in trouble. Two, we should pray because we're in a fierce battle. Constantly, we are warned uh, of the devil's intention to neutralise and demoralise us. We are told in Ephesians 6.10 that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the dark of this world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We, folks, are in a battle, and we need the help of God. The enemy has marshaled his army. When we, ne when we, sorry, and when we neglect prayer, we go into that battle unarmed. Now I find it helpful to remember that Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, found it necessary to pray. That makes me feel with joy that if Jesus could do it, if he needs to face that battle in his own strength, then we should, we should do that as well. We should pray. And, for, and thirdly, prayer is a deterrent to sin in our lives. In the quiet times of private, honest prayer, God exposes the thinking and excuses that we use to cater to sin. In prayer, God's up a, God, God holds up a mirror to our lives so that we can see the way that we really are and then repent. Another thing is that prayer makes a difference. Can't tell you how it works. I know that circumstances change, though, when people pray. Diseases are sometimes healed. Strength is imparted. Guidance is given. Hearts are softened. Needs are met. I know that when I pray for others, it helps them. And so it's the same for you when you pray for people and circumstances. It helps. But I also know that when I pray, I am changed. One of the most informative parts of the text that we read out is noticing what Paul asks on behalf of the Colossians. Paul does not focus on the material and the worldly. He is not uh, primarily concerned with comfort. He is concerned about their spiritual growth. Notice that Paul's first request is this, I ask that God fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And the word fill means to be completely filled. The word uh, for Norwich, knowledge, Norwich? I don't think Norwich is in there, but the word for knowledge is the normal uh, Greek word for knowledge with a prefix that intensifies the meaning. Paul's primary concern is not for physical health, material prosperity, 
effective witnessing or a greater experience of spiritual gifts, which are great in themselves. But Paul's first and primary concern is that Colossians come to love and understand God and submit to his will. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he sought to submit to the will of the Father. And many of us have turned around. We spend our time pleading with God that my will would be done. We want God to give us what we want. We want him to see the wisdom of our desires. Some even proclaim that praying thy will be done is a weak prayer. All I can say to such nonsense is tell that to Jesus. We come to understand God's will as we come to understand God. In our marriage relationships, we can often tell you what our spouse will say to a certain request. How can we do this? We have come to understand our mate. We know what they are like and we know what they like and what they don't like. We have a good idea of what their will is. The same is true of God. We understand his plan and his purpose in life as we come to know him through the Bible, through prayer and also through obedience. Paul prays that the Colossians would not be satisfied with a superficial relationship with God. He prays that they would continue to build a relationship with him until they understand what God is doing and why. Paul does not only pray that the Colossians are able to discern God's will, he prays that they might have the power to do God's will. Paul is seeking balance in the lives of these young Christians. He prays that they might understand and when they have understood that they might live on the basis of that understanding. Do you see how much, how much different the content of this prayer is from the prayers that we often pray or that I often pray? When we pray for others, are we aiming low? Are we asking the Lord for superficial things and neglecting the greater things? Are we focusing on the temporary and neglecting the eternal? Dare we spend all our time focusing on the body and no time focusing on the soul? Before I conclude this too brief sermon on this vital issue of prayer, let me challenge you to two obstacles that I found difficult in prayer. One of the biggest obstacles to prayer is that, well, that I have found and that we, we often find is that we are too busy. We say that we have a hard time finding uh, a time to pray. We need our sleep, especially in the morning, so that I can function throughout the day. We're busy with family activities after work. We stay up late because we need to finish our work or there's something I need to watch on TV. We want to pray, we say, but we just don't, just don't find or can't find the time. So I was praying about this, God asked me some pointed questions, which I'm gonna reflect back to you. And they're, diff they're not easy. God said to me, do you stop to eat each day? Do you wash? Do you read the paper or watch the news? Do you have time to watch the big game on the television? Come on, don't you irons. Do you have time to take a nap? Do you have time to exercise? None of these things are wrong, but we find time for those. Which of those things are more important and building your or our relationship with the Father. Which of these things has an internal dimension to it? If you really don't have time to pray, substitute prayer for one of those things you do have time for. If we're completely honest, many, many of us would probably admit that one of the greatest obstacles to prayer is the difficulty we have in concentrating. We start out in prayer, but then our minds begin to wander. 
seem futile, so we stop praying. Pause to remember who you are talking to. The more important we believe the conversation to be, the more attention we give it. So let me share a few things that have helped me uh, to pray. One, set aside a time for prayer. Get up early, block off a certain time, find a quiet place, pray as you're walking. If you've got a pet, take them the dog for a walk. Pray as you take the dog for a walk. Please give prayer the priority in your calendar, in your schedule, in your life. Secondly, discuss your life with the Father. Too many times we uh, do our prayers and then move on. We take care of our guilt, but we never really touch, touch the throne. So make your prayer time personal. Talk honestly about your struggles, your fears, your calendar. And listen so carefully to what what God is saying to you back. Thirdly, you could use your Bible as a starting point. Read through a passage of scripture, then apply uh, that scripture to your life. When you read the command around forgive others, ask God to release the bitterness and hurt that makes you resist that command. When you read about the importance of thinking pure thoughts, confess the areas where your thinking is polluted and ask God for help to think things better, to think better. This practice will help you focus on the deeper issues rather than the superficial. Fourthly, keep a prayer list. Make a list of people you pray for. Be specific. Um, what needs do you want uh, to help carry for another? When someone asks you to pray for them, add them to your list. Then make it a point uh, to then make a point to contact them, to tell them that you are praying for them. This is important because the next time you we are, we are tempted to neglect our time of prayer, we'll remember that we told someone we, we were praying for them, and then our desire to be faithful will give us will make us more time to pray. Fifthly, take time to notice God answers to prayer. God answers in many ways. Sometimes he gives us what we expect. Sometimes he answers in unexpected ways. Sometimes he removes a burden. Other times he gives us the strength to endure that burden. Sometimes he provides the things we want. Other times he changes our wants by teaching us to be content. Sometimes he answers right away, other times he waits until we're ready. Notice the answers when you and when you notice, thank him. And lastly, read books on prayer. Read biographies of people who prayed. Don't do this instead of praying. Do it as an encouragement to prayer. These books and resources remind us the things uh, the devil hopes we will forget because they all spur us on. You know, folks, what I desire most of all today is not that you feel guilty about your lack of prayer life. I want you to feel hungry for a greater prayer life. I don't want to beat you up. I want you, I want to spur you on. I want you to be able to come and see prayer, not as a duty, but as a privilege. I want you to pray not because of our battle with the devil, or because of the pain of those around you, I want you to pray because of the sweetness that comes from spending time with the Father. I will leave you with these words from the great Charles Haddon Spurgeon. The heart of prayer is the prayer of the heart. It does not consist simply of words, gestures, forms or eloquence. Prayer is the address of a poor creature on earth to a great creator and a loving father in heaven. Why don't you join us this evening? There's an opportunity to pray 
at seven o'clock. Use the link on the email that was sent you or go onto the website and it will show you where to go. We pray every Sunday night from 7 to 7.30 uh, as a group uh, together. And we've had some fantastic times of prayer and seen some great answers uh, to what God uh, to, to what God uh, is doing among his uh, people. So I encourage you, join us tonight at 7. Um, and I encourage you to pray to God. Get that conversation going. God bless you. Have a great week. Bye for now. Thank you for being with us um, throughout this service. It's been really nice to have you with us. Um, if you've joined in with our 10.30 service, then please just come along to the coffee and catch up and just pour yourself a drink and settle down and come along and say hi. Yeah, click on the link just there and uh, come and join in on Zoom. Caleb, what, do you, what were you going to say? Thank you so everybody. Hi Karen. Hi Karen. Thank you for <laughs> thanks to Kobe for editing this service and for Rachel leading us into worship. And John, thanks so much for that message. We're going to end our service actually. We've seen a couple of video clips from our friends in Liberia. We mentioned the money being raised for the um, water project there, but actually these guys uh, serve us and are a blessing to us too. And they've had a few days prayer of, of praying and fasting, and they've been praying for us, praying for our church. And so these guys are amazing and they love us and they're supporting us and they're praying for us. And so watch a couple of these video clips. This is City of Truth Church in Monrovia, in Liberia, led by Jonathan Nathan and his wife Lydia. And they're good friends of us. And so, yeah, let's enjoy watching this video and then come and join us on the Zoom coffee and catch up. And thank you so much for being with us today. God bless you guys. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.